Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome along to our coverage of the 2024 Dairy Tech event right here at uh, Stone Lee Park. Uh, I've got to admit, it's a first for me, Adam, and I'm really looking forward to this event. Looks like there's lots of tech yes, for me to get definitely. my teeth stuck into. So we should kick off with you, Adam, yeah. at De Laval. So everybody, this is uh, Adam Haywood. Hi there, Rob. Um, so Adam, we are near one of the products that you look after, yep. which you specialise in, which yep. is the robots. So yep. what's new in the world of De Laval milking robots? Well, what's new in the box itself is not new. Uh, where we see or where we see the future of things moving is, and what is new, is the way we're handling our data. So yes, we have all a central point where we produce huge amounts of data from. These produce so much data on a per quarter basis, per cow basis, throughout the day. Huge amounts of data set, and how do we process all that data? Well, traditionally, you look through lots of numbers on a herd management software, and you see what is working, what's not. That's it. It's clunky. And traditionally, yeah, yeah. we were sort of yeah. overwhelmed with a lot of data, yes. data, 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 yeah. and it was Definitely. up to the farmer or the herd manager, whoever, to, let's say, sift through that data yeah. and try and make something of it. So, are you making yeah, something and of and it that now? That is where we're making right. something of it, and we're calling it Delaval Plus. It's integrated into our herd, uh, herd management platform, so it's not a new one. So, we're basically giving insights into the data rather than going through your full cow list. You just look at the attention of the top three, four cows that have an issue. The headlines. Yeah, the headlines. Yeah. So you think from a working point of view, when you're working, you're looking at your, your daily workload, you have a shorter working list rather than a big list to go through. It makes your decision making, your planning your daily work so much easier. Yes. And that's what we're working on. And we're using all the different sensors that the machines have, whether it's body condition scoring, pedestrian testing, um, so many things, milking performance of the cow, and combining them all and sort of making a way that we can see the tangible data. Rather than a human doing it, AI does it. So it can start to see the trends right. and what is working. That human would take years of experience to work out. A computer can do it instantly. So providing live data as well. That's it. And I would imagine the more cows that are going through your robots around the world, oh, yeah. the more it learns. The more it learns. And the better exactly it gets. Right, the more yeah. accurate the it gets. The more cows, the more sensors it goes through. And it's not just for new products as well. Existing customers um, with older parlors, with Dell Pro systems, can have this benefit from this system as well. So yes, we, we, we focus on the robots, but it's not, the system's not just for robots. It's for our conventional parlors and our robots as well. So it crosses all our portfolio. Right. So it's for the whole business, so not just So a lot of the there. tech that you can find on this, yeah. a lot of the sensors, you might say, exactly you right. can apply it to your yeah, other types of milking exactly systems. Right. So we've learned a huge amount because it's so controlled as a robot, it milks in the same way each time. So we learn a lot from the robot and we can apply that across onto the conventional side as well. So we learn a lot from this test bench, let's say, that's continually milking all day. And a lot of this data that, that is being you know, harvested from the robots or from your herring bones or wherever it may be, yeah. can, you then, can it then start to make some automated decisions yeah. in terms of drafting and things like that? That is where we're moving to. At the moment, no. If it's automatic decision making, there still needs to be a human trigger. Yeah. So there still needs to be a human airlock, let's call it, between the data being presented and decision being shown and action. Yeah, so there still is a human airlock. So they need yeah. to say, still yes. Still that, lead, that interpreter still in there. Exactly yeah. right. Uh, we will get that. Uh, yeah. Not at the moment, though. Bill of Al plus extra. Plus, plus. Plus, plus. <laughs> <laughs> They'll hate me for saying that, but that is where it is. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. And we will get there. Right. We're seeing more automation all the time. So. This thing automatically identifies a cow and it automatically. So there's already a lot in this, isn't there? So it already does some of that, but it's more the hard decision making uh, behind reproduction, behind drafting, behind health of cow that still does need a human interaction as well. You can't replace a vet. It can help and aid a vet, yeah. but um, it won't replace a vet or a skilled herdsman. It only complements them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say, you just mentioned vet there. Some of this data that's being harvested, can, there, can your vet have. Yes. You know, real-time sight of that yeah, they as have well as the farmer. The same access that the farmer can, as long as the farmer gives them access to it. Yeah. They can see the data as well. And it's very common for the vet to well, heavily work in relation with what is being produced. And they're becoming more and more changing the way they're working on farm with the likes of the pregnancy checking and so forth that this machine can do. 
they're working in a different way on farm as well. Not pregnancy checking the whole herd, yeah. there's a shorter working list. So again, their time on farm is better used rather than yeah. trying Let's to find everything. Let's go look everything. at those first exactly. five today. That's what we see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. speeding up the work. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of the platform where we can see all this data and see all these highlighted figures or yeah. actions, you might say, I assume Obviously, Delaval will have its own platform portal yeah, to do we, that. We call it Delpro. Yeah. Um, and we also have Delaval Plus as the, the name of what it does. But essentially, all your herd management uh, is done via the piece of software called Delpro. Now, everyone says, oh, what happens if we lose internet? I won't be able to milk. It's not the case. We still have a hard computer on farm. Yeah. So if the power went out and we switched the generator on and we lose internet connection, we can still milk cows. And we can still collect data because we have an internal network yeah. on farm. So we're not reliant. Yes, it's an essential part, is a data connection. But if something goes wrong, we can still milk. That's it. Yeah, it's built that way. So and I assume as, as yeah. soon as that data connection is restored, then it'll start of course, uploading again. It uploads again. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again. And Dell yeah. Pro, is that compatible with other platforms such as, you know, TMR planning platforms uh, and uniform, things like that? To a certain degree, yes. Yeah. We're working on a, a more streamlined integration so called Dell of Our Sync which will then automatically share the information back and forwards. The minimum we can share it, but it's still a manual process. We want an automatic process, yeah. and we will get there. Right. Uh, and we're very close to that, <laughs> I should say. Well, I'm not going to say yes, we're doing it today, <laughs> because we will get there, yeah. and we are very, very close. The likes of Uniform, Cow Registry, and that side of it is going to be hopefully seamless in the not so distant future. Perfect. So what we're seeing already, a lot of tech already in your milking systems. Yeah. It's growing all the time. Absolutely. And it'll be even more compatible in the future yeah. with other systems as well. And new and old. Yeah, again, yeah. it's not just the latest. We we're bringing this tech on the existing customers because customers got a parlor there, ten yeah, years yeah. old. Oh, I need to invest. No, we can actually invest so very it's small amounts. Perfectly amount. retrofitable yeah. then. Exactly right. Yeah, and that's what we wanted to achieve. Yeah, to so, uh, help lift milk and performance and aid our existing customers as well as new customers, and that's that's the idea of the system. Cool stuff. Well, Adam, thank you very much for your time. Absolutely Absolute. spot thank on as much. ever. Yeah, very good. Thank you. <laughs>
You've ticked the box. That's it. <laughs> Validated. Yeah. So Validated. what, for in particular for Metcalf Farms, what impact has it had on their business? So they, because they um, record mastitis by quarter, mm. uh, Philip knew he had a bias. And so that was the reason for starting to look at something like this, was to try and sort that bias of mastitis cases out. And obviously when we started, we had no idea whether it would just move them from the front to the back and you'd end up with the same number of cases, but just yeah, you could have shifted it, couldn't yeah, you? you could have, yeah. But it didn't, thankfully. And there was no way of knowing that until we'd put it on every point, used it on every cow, and got enough data to show that it didn't. So it took quite a while for that to sort of gather that data. And um, But the top of it is it, it didn't. It brought the, the front cases back down. Uh, and also the, re the rear's lowered as well. Right. So it did a, did a good job. So when we saw it at Metcalf, so obviously it's on a big rotary parlour there. Yeah. That was the initial design for it. Yeah. What developments have happened since then? Is it available on Herringbone parlours, rapid exit parlours? Yeah. Where are we up to with it? So yeah, so we started with rotaries. Uh, so it's on several rotaries now. Uh, we've also got a couple of uh, rapid exits and then uh, we're working on the herringbone version. Right. The herringbone version has taken quite some doing. Is it a little bit more yeah, it's challenging just, compared to the rotary, you might say? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's trying to get it in such a way that uh, it works as you want it to and does exactly what it should do. So James, you've got a bit of a, a virtual parlour set up here, so just demonstrate how, this, uh, how yeah. this device works. So literally on as normal Yeah. with your cluster. Yeah, put your cluster on. Pull the cord out, flick it up. And then just do sort of yeah. one movement just like that. Yeah. It's done. And, it, and it, people who do it all the time are a lot slicker than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, when were you last in a parlour? <laughs> yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, basically, when it uh, when it cluster comes off, yeah. it uh, cord pulls it off. Just like that. So, like in that. just one Not quite as much action, as one <laughs> yeah. movement. Yeah. It's all done. Yeah. No it. extra mechanical bits on here to no. make it move. No. It's just a bracket. Yeah, just and that's it. Fill some holes, bolt it on, dogs are good. There you go, well, oh, yeah. that's what they're saying. It's uh, the simplest ideas <laughs> are the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Spot so. on, well, I wish you all the best with it. Good job, thank you very much. Good stuff. Yes, we continue our coverage of the 2024 uh, Dairy Tech event. We're now on the uh, Hoof Count stand, famous for its range of foot baths. And with the main man himself, Mr. Anthony Marsh, who's going to initially talk us through a new development that they are previewing at the event, and maybe we'll cover some of your other products as well. So, Anthony, what's this that we that we are leaning on. So yes. very, very top secret here, we're just previewing right. at the Dairy Tech, the uh, Pediview system, which is a camera on the exit to the foot bath, which is gonna monitor the health of the feet. Right, so is it one camera, a couple of cameras looking from different angles? How's it sort of work? I one... know you don't wanna give too many <laughs> secrets away. No, it's okay, one camera looking out, uh, as the cow walks over the front of the bath, it then, using AI and machine learning, will take a video and then detect which hoof it is, and tell you if there's any problems on that hoof. Right, so is it sort of looking up or straight on? As looking straight out. Right, straight so, out of, the, yeah. out of yeah. all the feet. And as the feet come over the front here, it can then look at the lifted hoof. Right. So it looks at the underneath of the hoof every time. Yeah, so it can literally monitor each hoof individually. Uh, yeah, and using machine learning AI, it can then tell you if there's a problem on that hoof, a lesion or a digital dermatitis, or maybe other problems as well. So basically, right. We've taken thousands and thousands of images over the last 12 months. Yeah, you've taught it what to do, basically. taught it what to look taught for. It, yeah. So, and, and the more we can feed into it, so as it develops, the better it'll be. So we teach it what it is to look for, and then the cameras, you know, the, the technology they've got nowadays, look for that and send the farmer a notification yeah. when there's a problem. So down the line then, the more cows keep going through this system yeah. with the camera and the AI learning, yeah. it'll learn even more yes. going further yeah. down the line and ultimately will it get more accurate as it'll well? It'll get more accurate and it'll get earlier when it sees a problem. So the earlier we can see a problem, Early the quicker can... we can treat it, the better the chance that cow has of getting back to zero, um, you know, back to perfect again. Right. 
And all this data that this, these cameras are monitoring and recording, what happens to all this data? Where does it get fed to? That kind uh, they tell me it's in the cloud and when it rains it comes down. I don't know. Right. <laughs> it's above my, above my pay grade, but it's somewhere up there. Yeah. It's all sent back to a server we have. It's all processed. Some of it's processed on farm, depending on what information it is. Yeah. And depends on how many cows you have. And then it comes back as notification. You know, as, as people, we don't want all that data. But we want the notification of what that data is about. We want the so essentials, basically. It's, it's right? our job to then interpret that data, send the farmer a, a reminder or a notification of what he has to do. Right. So Keep these, it simple. Yeah. So these reminders and notifications that the farmers are getting, is it via an app on the phone? Yeah. or It'll be via an app. It'll ping up a cow needs treating. It'll then give him a weekly treatment list of what he has to do. He ticks a box, treated it. If he needs retreating, it'll come back up again. If not, gone. Right. And then we've got a record then for future reference as well. I see, you've got full traceability yeah. there, haven't you? Yeah. Every case alone has cost £300. If yeah. we can reduce that number of cases, it's going to be more cost effective. Well, that's it. Some of that adds up, that, yeah. isn't it? Better for the farm, better for the environment. You know, we prevent a lot of laneness with our range of foot baths, yeah. which is the first priority. Right. And foot bathing is key. If we can start monitoring what's going on with those foot baths and monitoring what's going on with the cows, you're taking better. it to another yeah, level. Another level altogether. Right. And then, as it's monitoring the foot health, is it tied into a drafting system as well? It can draft them off. It, it will be able to if you want to, but at the moment it's just a. At the moment, it, a farmer would only see dermatitis it's probably about three or four weeks too late. Right. So if we when can it's tell, really we can, visible, we, we can tell him a week. You know, at week one. Yeah. At some point during that week, then he can then treat it. They can jump on it and get it sorted. Yeah, but we can we can link into shedding gates if we want to, but. At right. the moment, you might be able to treat in the parlour. Treat in the parlour, it's easier than having to lift the cow in a crush. And this data as well, as well as the farmer being able to see it, is this, some, is this something you could share with your vets that they could see it in real time as well? If, if you want to, you can share it with your vets or with the lame your hoof trimmer. Yeah. Um, that's entirely up to the farmer. So, so, yeah, more information that people have, more integrated approach we have, the yeah. better a chance we have of getting healthy cows. Right. Healthy cow, more profitable cow, less carbon footprint. Exactly. All adds up together. That's it. And at the moment, like I say, it's a preview yes. at the moment. So when are you thinking sort of full-on launch with we're, this? We're on four farms in the UK at the moment, just as a, as to get all the trial data. Yeah. It'll be launched in the next two or three months. All right, so it's fairly so, imminent yeah. then. Yeah. Good stuff. And then, yeah, talk us through some of your other things that you've got in the stand. The bits that you're famous for, obviously, yeah, the, your foot bath. The hoof cow foot bath's been out 12 years. Um, yeah, the foot bath is a job that nobody likes to do. Yeah. So what we've done is automate it. Yeah. Large number of herds, robotic herds. You know, you haven't got time to start changing the foot bath. It's very important it gets changed at the right time. So our foot, foot baths count the number of cows through the bath, then empty, wash out, refill, add the chemical in which nobody wants to handle. No. So all very important things just Making a job that's not enjoyable, make it done properly and effectively. Yeah. And that's all we've ever done. We're not saying the world on fire with the new technology with that one. We just want to make a system yeah. which is reliable for people. Well, it's like anything, isn't it? If you make it easy to yeah, do, it gets it'll done. get done better yeah. and more regularly, yeah. won't it? And, and it's key. Prevention is always key. Yeah. So. And this, sorry, just going back to this yeah. again, just this camera system that we've got, will you be able to retrofit this to your existing footpaths? Yes. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and the feet are then clean when they come through the camera, so it's easy for the camera to see what's going on. Yeah. Cracking stuff. Well, I look forward to seeing how this develops in the future. For yeah. now, thank you very much, Anthony, for that. Thank you. It's been absolutely spot on, is that? <laughs>
Yeah. 25 to 30% storage saving. So it's a heck of a lot when you look at a million gallons. You know, it's like you've nearly saved a ring on a tower. That's it, yeah. It's like, you know, it saves putting another tower up nearly. Oh, but it will do. That's it, yeah. And then you move on to the boys that are green bedding. So I would say at the other end of the scale that want it really dry, really dry to dry. reuse again. Yep. We can alter the dryness on this really simply. By a screw on the end, we can move the auger backwards and forwards. So we can get this so dry that when it comes out, you pick it up, squeeze it, there is no liquid, no moisture. Right. And it's a case of yeah, your green bedding, you know, you are fit to go straight in. What sort of percentage moisture would you have at, at that stage? You can get down to like 35% moisture or less in, right. in it. So it's pretty dry fluff at that. It is sort dry of stage. fluff. If you get some straight out of the machine, it looks a little bit lumpy, but it is dry. You throw it on somewhere that there's no moisture at all, five minutes it just all swells up and it nearly blows yeah. away. Pulling the moisture back in, back out of the, you know, wherever else to yes. slurry them. Pulls it out of the yeah. atmosphere. So we have one of these set up on a mobile unit. We call it the Pro Plus, it's the X Split, which is what the unit is. It's the Pro unit on a lift frame. It's on a trailer, we can tow it onto site and Sucks in through a rotary load pump of Orgel Sang 1 through a machine we call a rotor cut. Yeah. We haven't got one on the stand, so I can't show you one, unfortunately. What that does, it takes any solids out. So anything that shouldn't go through a machine, i.e. metal, etc., that's yeah. been sucked up, pulls that out, leaves it in the bottom. And if it's small enough and floats, it cuts it up so it doesn't damage the system. It goes through the pumps, then pumps up through your separator system. And you know, people are like, oh, it's going to be very, very slow. You watch one working, and you think there's not much coming out when you watch the output of the machine. Yeah. But then you watch what's actually going through it liquid-wise. Yeah. And 35... What's going into it, what's really? what's going yeah. in and what's coming out. You can run up to 35 cubes running really dry, and it drops off up to 50 cubes if you're running it slightly damper. Right. So once it's been through there, on the mobile, it runs down through another pump, pump a weighted tower. Yeah. So, yes, we have one as a demo unit, brilliant. But the customer, the end user, can actually buy one as a contractor going farm to farm. Right. Or if he's a farmer that's got multi-sites. So from developing this to be like a static unit, yep. as it's in main intention, but you found from taking it as a mobile unit site to site that there's actually there is a demand for that, there a market is a for that. For it. There is a marketplace. You know, and we have people going like, ooh, you know, I can see a, a new business forming from just yeah. going around separating slurry. And you know, the way you talk to everybody, it seems to be the way forward. Right. You, all your nitrogen stays in your liquid. Yeah. You're peeing your keys in your solids. And so it's like, yeah, that's sorted. And then you come to spread your liquid. You have hardly any fibre in there, so it's so easy to spread through a dribble barrel. So we're chain. getting less leaf contamination, presumably. Yep. You know, it's not sticking it's to not the leaves. It's not leaving anything on the top. So it's all going it's all to going the bottom in. of the plant where it should be, yep. where you want it, really. Yep. You know, handling's easier. It just makes everything a lot better right through the system. Right. And like you were saying before, with this one unit, you can actually tailor it quite a bit to go from that really dry stuff to, you know, the, the wetter stuff. Oh, you stuff. can, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, you know, and it doesn't take a lot of doing. There's a one bolt on the end. Yeah. Or you can even have an automatic system that you can control from the control box to alter right. everything. So you don't have to climb up your gantry yeah. and alter things by hand. Yeah. And you don't have to alter sieves or anything like that? No. No? no. They just stay in place? They just stay in place. The sieve that we have in here as well is a three-piece sieve. So when the time comes, because everything does wear eventually, yeah. the time comes to replace a sieve, it's not a whole unit, you're just replacing the end that's worn, which is usually your front sieve. So you then just shuffle the foot. Oh, just forwards. switch them around. So you put the new one in the end and then just... Yeah. Away you go. And just keep it cycling away. Right. It is such a simple unit. Nice and easy to work on. Good to install. You know, it's, you can nearly say it's bomb-proof. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly looks it anyway. In it terms is. of its build, anyway. It is. But, you know, done in the German factory in Oldenburg. Yeah. And, you know, the testing is non-stop basically if they develop something they will keep pushing it forwards it's not a case of make something and leave it it's if they can alter it and make it better they will crack it off well andy Spot thank up. you very much for your time on that's You're been very uh, yeah no, it's been really good to uh, find out a little bit more about your separators
Good. Perfect. If you want to watch one working, just give me a shout and we'll come and watch it. We might just do that. Yeah. Spot on. No We move on uh, with our coverage at the 2024 Dairy Tech event uh, show and we are now on the Taffy tractor stand and I've got to say it's the first time I've seen one in the flesh so to find out what they are actually all about I've got the man himself from Taffy Tractors which is Mr Martin Richards. So Taffy Tractors, um, how long have you been sort of bringing them into the UK? Uh, 24 years we've been <coughs> importing them into the UK now. Um, they're mainly for yard scraping on livestock farms. About 80% of them are yard scraping. The remaining 20% are on small holdings, hobby farms, stable yards, and they're usually four wheel drives with loaders. Right. Um, we have the complete range of sizes of scraper tractor farmers from 100 cows to four and a half thousand cows. Uh, we've got customers doing over 4,000 hours of yard scraping a year. That, so that, clock it up a few hours yeah, then. Uh -huh. That actually equates to three full-time tractor drivers on one tractor. Really? Uh, Just sort of shift work almost? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and their um, policies are to keep them two years, around the eight, nine thousand hours, and trade them in. We've got one customer that's been doing that since we started 24 years ago. Um, we've got a lot of other big farms. That's a loyal one, that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, what, uh, the biggest selling feature is what we haven't got. Right, so keeping it simple. Well, everything we haven't got will never go wrong. And we guarantee... <laughs> I like that. We guarantee all the gadgets, the electronic hydraulics, the power shifts, the air con, the radio that our competitors have got will go wrong. Yeah. One day, but it will go wrong, and they will have a bill for it. Right. Uh, um, so what we've got here then is essentially an engine, a simple gearbox, some linkage, and four wheels. Yep, and that's, that is that it. That is it. Yeah, and you can go to your local Massey Ferguson dealer, you can get spare parts from most agricultural tractor dealers that, with, that sell the likes of Vapormatic, Sparex, AgriLine, non-genuine parts. Not that we would necessarily advocate the fitting of yeah. them, but it's another alternative. But in terms of spares, there's an abundance yeah, to we, look after these. We feel there is a better parts backup for these tractors than any other maker tractor <laughs> available today because you have so many choices of suppliers. Yeah. You can buy a brand new one of these tractors today, have a road accident with it, or and break a casting or another component and you can go to a Massey Ferguson breaker's yard and pick up a bit from a 1970s tractor that will bolt straight on it. Um, so that's what we're selling is the reliability yeah. that we get from simplicity. Right, and where are these tractors built, the, the Taffy tractors? They're built in India in a factory um, that was in, formerly in Madras but that Madras is now called Chennai. The, it's one of the largest tractor factories in the world per unit sold from really? one, one location. My understanding is that the only tractor factory that produces more tractors from one location is the Belarus factory in Belarus in Russia. Really? The factory where these are built in India um, is just a massive factory and they're all hand assembled on a, a simple production line. You see them um, put a gearbox on a little trolley on a railway line and two people push that railway line of that trolley <laughs> along the and behind them there'll be stillages of parts yeah. and those two people build them up and when it gets to the end of the production line they sign them off 
and we actually know who the senior one of the two people was that built yeah. the tractor. So he could go back to them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we can say that this tractor was built by Fred and you should sack him. Yeah. Or we can um, send him a can of beer and say, Yeah, he got it spot on. Yeah. yeah. So these these Taffy tractors then, I mean obviously they are based on they're based on a Massa Ferguson tractor. Yeah. So what would these these ones that we're looking at today, what would these be sort of based on? What would people well, know, this, know these Massa when, it, when it's sold in America, um, this one we're next to here would be sold as a Massey Ferguson 240. Right. Um, okay. Uh, and that's the same tractor, so that's the same model number is this tractor would have come off the Coventry production line uh, and more than 95% of the parts would interchange and there uh, just been some changes since the Coventry factory shut but there yeah. are only minimal changes that have been made. And in terms of the, the sort of like horsepower levels that you're offering for the UK, what sort of well, what models the, are we talking? In the 200 range equivalent um, of the Massey, we offer the 35 Di, which is 37 horsepower, the 45 Di, which is 47 horsepower, and the 45 TDI, the turbocharged version, which is 60 horsepower. Later in the year, we will have the Taffy 75 15 tractor. Um, which goes up to 75 horsepower. Right. Again, sticking very basic, simple, not loads of sensors. Yeah. No limp home mode when the transmission Just sensors go. Get on or, and go and yeah. keep it simple. Like yeah. Yeah. You know, these electronics, a lot of them will break down when the tractor is parked in the shed overnight. You put it away at night and the electric. It was working, will work yeah. <laughs> you go to start it the next day and the hydraulics won't go up. Yeah. You know, we pride ourselves, we've got a mechanical lever and you pull it up for up and down for down. Um, if you go back to the 1980s, um, the drivers were strong enough to pull the lever up. <laughs> and I re now, now that they're going to the gym, you'd think they'd still be able say. to pull yeah. the lever. But no, they just want a little switch to flip that's the it. finger. That's it, a little switch, a little Edmund, Edlund management system and that's yeah. it. Well, Martin, thank you very much for talking us through that. It's been, uh, it's been great to actually have, finally have a look at these tractors. Yeah. Uh, and you never know, hopefully one day we might try one out as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much for thank that. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Gents, you now join us with a company that is local to me, based in uh, Garstang, which is the world famous Collinson. So I'm now joined by Sally Hayton, who's going to talk to us about one of their latest developments. That's if you can still see it, because it's very, very busy. <laughs> there are you. It's good that it's busy. Well, exactly. So, Sally, Feed Alert. What's Feed Alert all about? Feed Alert is our new digital technology for understanding how much feed is in a silo, because until now, um, there was no way of doing it. People look at the level indicators. I'm going to say, look through the little windows. Look through the windows, but, but they can get dust on them, and not all silos have windows, and so very often they'll tap it with a piece of wood yeah. or with a golf balls as well. I know exactly what you mean. You knock it at the bottom That's and wait right. for it to drop down, wait for that middle <laughs> bit to fall down. Oh, you think it's there and yeah. then it just drops down. It's like, oh no, what are we doing now? <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> it's not ready. <laughs> Yeah, and so if, if, if that happens and someone runs out of feed, they have an outage or the feed company can't get it there in time and it has massive consequences that ripple and absolutely and so it affects the milk yield and if the milk yield drops and then when they do get the feed, they then have to build it up again and so that, that financial loss is more than a feed alert. So it's a there you system. go, I'm yeah. sold already. <laughs> I wish I had about this when I was a lot. So, feed alert then, go on, how does it actually work, you know, in terms of, you know, what's inside the bin that monitors the levels? It's, it's so clever. So, it's this sensor here, which right. is a, a strain gauge, and it goes on the, the, the leg of the silo. It goes on any silos, not just Collinson silos. So right. You can monitor. So, you can retrofit this to anybody's silo. Absolutely. It can be retrofit in half an hour. 
um, and it stresses the tension in the leg. So once it's installed, we need to get the silo empty or as close to empty as possible, tear the silo, yeah. and then after the delivery, we calibrate it to a delivered amount, and that sets a scale. Right. And then as the feed is used, it, it comes down and you can see how much is on there. So as simple as that? As simple as that. So basically it's technology that we've seen for decades on diet feeders, strain gauges. Oh, yeah. It's and you've just applied it to a, a silo tower. We have, so we did a lot of R&D and we have refined yeah. it. Yeah, right? I would say you've not just slapped one on and had, had a go, no. The, so it is built to our specification, but yeah, in essence, that's it. And it's a low cost solution. At Collinson, we also have load cells. Yeah. Now they are finite accurate. Yeah. And so literally they'll tell you to within grams, but it's also two, two and a half thousand pounds a silo. Whereas this is 450 pounds. Right. So it's low cost So this is a nice, like say yeah. a low cost solution to it's a critical like, problem that it, it could is. occur. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it takes, so once you've installed it and it's yeah. been teared and calibrated, it takes a reading once a day. And it does that because the, the sensor can be affected by sunshine and heat. So if we, we could give you a daytime reading, but if we did and the sun was bright or it went behind a cloud, it'd fluctuate. Right. So giving it your 11.30, yeah. it's consistent and so it's reliable. And how accurate is this system? So it's 95% or greater, so it's a 5% variant window. So on a 20 ton silo, yeah. it could be up to a ton out. But for inventory control and reordering, it's, it's plenty. It's absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, it's better than getting down to that last sight glass and all of a sudden it just drops out. Absolutely. <laughs> but, 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 but some silos, so you've got your 5% window, but some silos might track in at 50 or 100 kg out. Yeah. It's, it, it is a window and so there's different factors, but we can give you the 95% accuracy. Right. And the alerts that you get from it, are they sent to your phone or where are they sent to that? They're sent so you, get, you can have them by push notification to your phone or you can have an email or you can have both. Right. Um, you can download the app, there's no subscription, so you, you so can it's just, have it. So it's just one cost only this? One cost only, right. yeah. You can have it, you can invite your team, so if you have a farm manager, yeah, they can also look at the data as well. Yeah. If you choose to do so, you can uh, you can share the data with your feed company. Right, um, so they can keep track of the levels yeah. and they can be they don't placing the order automatically. Well, they don't take ownership of it because right. it's new technology. The industry are just getting used to right. it. And so there's that relationship and trust building. But they uh, they do tend to pick up the phone yeah. so we can see. Just to let you know, yeah. you're getting a bit lower. Yeah? yeah, do you right. want us to place an order? But that's an agreement with the farmer and how they want to play it. Yeah. But it gives them the insight. Um, you can see a seven day forecast so you can plan ahead. Um, a lot. So you, well, that's it, you'll be able to track it, won't you? You can right. track it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've got it on your app, as I say, and you can see how much is there. And uh, it's a red, amber, green later. So if yeah. you get to red, you're just like, whoa, you Come should be doing something. Yeah. Pick up that phone now. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we have a little calculator on the, on our website where you can actually put in your herd size, um, price of the milk, your average. Um, liters per cow yeah. and it could tell you that if you did have an outage and you missed a feed in parlor it would cost you x amount of pounds All right. and invariably it's more than the system yeah. i think i've said that already yeah but, well worth yeah, repeating absolutely well, it is that is uh, yeah. that is absolutely spot on that just a cracking cost effective device it is and if you share with the feed company the we've, we've done it low cost so we've done it as low as we can yeah. so it can be a mass market product and um the more there are in the country the, the more the feed companies will benefit yeah. and if they're making efficiency savings um with production and logistics ultimately it'll go down to the farmer there you so, go and everyone saves Top innovation from Lancashire. Absolutely. There we yeah. go. Always look into the future. <laughs> Joe, it's going well, Sally. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Absolutely spot on yeah, that. Thank brilliant. you. So, ladies and gents. We're now on the RE building stand. I'm joined by Mr. Dave Eason, who, well, you've got another new product from the Bob Man stable. 
we what, have. What is this you are perched upon? Uh, this is now a milk bus. This is the milk bus. This is all the aboard bus. the milk bus. All aboard. This is for mixing calf powder on this model. Yeah. And then distributing to feeding calves calf quickly. Right. And I would imagine this is just the job for those large dairy units that large. have a lot of calves. Yeah, large dairy units, even the mid-range ones, there's a, two models available, 1,000 litres, 500 litres. Right, uh, so this will be the 1,000 one. This is the 1,000, right. this is the, the, the big one. But yeah, all metered out milk, so each calf gets its correct amount. It's not just by the it's eye. It's not just by no. the eye, it's all metered and each calf has got its... Right, Correct so you say out. this is, like I say, this is geared up for milk powder, yeah. for mixing. I assume that's what this motor's that's about, what this is it? That's motor's for behind, yeah. So put your water in, warm water, put your powder in, give it a mix. And away you go. Off you go. Off on your little merry way. That's it. So and the, do you do a version without this motor on as well? Yeah, there's a pasteurisation uh, model right. so for heating milk. Yeah, uh, it has still the motor on, but slower versions. It's just a paddle rather than a mix. Right, uh, more just more of an agitator. Just more really. of an agitator. Right. Uh, still on the same base unit on that. So yeah. it's just literally slightly different variation in the yeah. tank. And the 500 litre version is that the same? It's just base? exactly the same, smaller tank, right. same base unit. Right. So this is the Bowman base unit. Yeah. All electric. Yeah. Uh, 48 volt, four batteries. Everything. Yeah. So this is what they call the Cobra on top of or right. underneath. And away you go. So, like I say, all battery powered. All battery powered. So, how long will you get out of a, a runtime, uh, roughly? Two and a half hours. Right, which should be plenty to. Should be plenty. Yeah. And then look the back, which you can look at in your video, there's the self clean unit. So, while it's cleaning, it charges. Right. So, yeah, it's all plugged in that way. So, you can pack it up, it can be charging, but it'd be cl it'd it be can be cleaning, be cleaning itself while you're out. Then doing right. other things. Clever stuff. Yeah. Uh, and you see, it's all it's all metered, is it? You got this metered. control panel this here, touch screen, is it? Touch that? screen control panel. It's all feeding, different presets, different variants, up to well, however many liters you want. So if you're feeding bigger pens, you can then go and put 100 liters out, not three. Yeah. So you can, yeah. That's right. So you just what? Is there a trigger on here that you just oh, there. just there, and that's I'll not it. Do it so I'll fill you. Yeah, I'm gonna say don't do that I'll just here. So, so you select the amount you to be discharged the and then be, just... Yeah. And off you go. Away you go. There's three preset models. Yeah. And then just your milk quantities in there or a continuous operation. And your list would just run up the side just of the car up the side. You've got your lance there. Lance comes off so you can then just walk away from it, press the button, it'll then distribute the right, yeah. the, your quantity set. Yeah. And if you do have to go into a pen, maybe a central trough, maybe a you've, central, got, a bit you've of, got a bit of length. Yeah, which is what we all need, yeah, really, isn't it? Always. Sometimes we're always a bit of, short a bit of length. Yeah. Uh, and has there been lots of interest? A lot of interest today. Yeah. Yeah, more than I expected. All right. Yeah. It's what they're after. It's what they're after. Yeah. What, what they feel. Well, that's it. When you think about the alternative, running up and down the yard with buckets and whatnot. Buckets and barrows and trolleys and mixing by hand and yeah. whisking. This is just this is the ticket. And where are these made? Is it, Denmark. Denmark. Denmark, right. Yeah. Right. Because you've been dealing with Bobman quite a while with uh, the we've been dealing with Bobman. With the dispensers 20, and sweepers and about twenty years dealing right. with Bobman. Yeah. So the sole importers into the UK of the Bobman yeah. brand. And have we any idea of prices on these at uh, all? Or? the five hundred litre model we think's gonna be around about the twenty five K mark. Yeah. And this will be just over the twenty eight. Spot on, well, Dave, as ever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Spot on, is yeah. that? I need Good to have thing. a goal on there. Yeah, we'll have, <laughs> we'll, uh, yeah, we'll have a do. That's it. Perfect. Our regular viewers to uh, LandPowerTV.com will know that we sort of specialise in doing farm machinery and technology reviews and customer testimonials and all things to do with farm machinery and technology. However, probably one of the bigger questions that uh, is on people's minds is how do we actually pay for all this farm machinery and technology? Of which the prices are just continuing to go one way. So to gain a little bit of industry insight into the world of financing in the agricultural marketplace. I'm now joined by Mr. Nick Evans, Managing Director and Founder of Oxbury, Oxbury Bank. 
So, Nick, easy, first... Easy for you to say. I know. Yeah, yeah. Wait until we've had a couple of pints out of here. <laughs> I've got to say, I like what you've done with the place. Yeah. This is a work of genius, this, yeah. the Oxenberry Arms. Who would imagine that giving free beer to farmers would, would create a bit of a crowd? Exactly, yes. Yeah. So, I know it is busy on here. Yeah. So, down to business then. Oxbury Bank. Yep. Uh, just tell us a little bit of the background about the bank. Yep. Okay, so um, we started, uh, the, the journey started, if you like, in 2018, when we had the idea that the UK needed a specialist agricultural bank. So France has got one, Credit Agricole, the Netherlands have got one in Rabobank, but we don't have a specialist agricultural bank in the UK. And, and here's the thing, their, G, their uh, agricultural uh, industry, as a percentage of their GDP, their gross domestic product, is 1.7% in France and 1.6% in Netherlands. Here, 0.7%. Right. I don't think that's a coincidence. So I think the UK needs a bank that really understands what these guys at the show uh, and, and the wider agricultural community actually need, someone that understands their business. Exactly. And the, the strategy of the core banks is, is really not to focus on individual businesses. They want to focus on retail, they want to focus on, on corporates. I think really now the, the UK farmer and other bits of industry, but UK farmer needs a bank that understands the industry in which exactly. we work. Exactly, a yeah. specialist yeah. bank. A specialist bank. Yeah. The other difference between what we've done, by the way, is, is Oxbury Bank is owned by farmers, right. by the industry. So uh, the three, there are three big show, bigger shareholders, one which is uh, Frontier Agriculture, uh, Hutchinson's and the Duke of Westminster. So they, okay. they between them, own about 40 odd percent. Right. But the other balance that is really then owned by farmers and landowners. So our shareholders, the people that own Oxbury, and our customers are all going in the same direction. We're right. all part of the agricultural community. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Basically, because. for farmers, by farmers, yeah. effectively. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So just talk us through maybe some of the products and services that you guys offer. Yeah. So. We went live in 2021, and the first product we went live with was savings. So banking is a very simple business. We get money from savers, including farmers, but general public, anybody can save with Oxbury. So we get money from savers, and we take that money, and then we lend it to farmers. And we only lend to farmers. Really? That's it. We don't right. lend to anybody else. And I think that's also really important. The people we have, the relationship managers you can see on the stand here, they are typically farmers, sons and daughters. They've typically got an agricultural background, agricultural training. Um, and then we train them in banking if they haven't got that banking expertise. Right. And So would uh, you say the, the ag industry knowledge is primary and then like you say, you can teach them the banking side? You can teach banking. Yeah. You can teach banking, but I'm not sure you can teach people ag. readily how to speak to a farmer. Yeah. 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 Agricultural it's knowledge. A different language. <laughs> it's, a it's a different language. So we went live. Anyone can save with, uh, with Oxbury, and, but we lend, only lend to farmers. And the products we lend, the, product, the lending products that we have are really broadly fall into three areas. We do short-term revolving credit, like an overdraft, but not an overdraft, short-term revolving credit. And what that means is we set a limit up for somebody, they can draw down from that limit into their current account when they need the money, and then they can pay us back when they don't. Right. To suit their cash flow. So product. really flexible. Really flexible. Number second product we do is asset finance, and I think everybody on the and everybody viewing will understand what asset finance yeah, is. Yeah. Your tractors, your machinery, and so on. So does that extend to farm infrastructure as well, buildings, things like that? It does. It? Yeah. So the bigger the building, the more likely it's to be less suitable for asset finance and more suitable mm. for a loan. Although we do stuff like solar panels, so they're not so easy to move, but we do those on asset finance because yeah. it's just a straightforward kind of deal. The thing about asset finance is a fixed rate and it's a fixed term for the life of the for the life of the of the agreement. And then we do long-term loans out to 25 years, and that's for things like land, for diversification, for some of your productivity and efficiency improvements. So on the stand today, we've had quite a few farmers. We've had heifer rearing sheds, we've had new new milking parlors, cow accommodation, uh, cow pathways. Mm. Those sort of things really improving the productivity and efficiency of the farm. Yeah, yeah. And like you just mentioned, there we're here today yep. at the Dairy Tech event. You were at Lama Show yep. a couple of weeks ago. Yep. What's the sort of general mood of the farming industry at the moment? So it's very difficult to generalise because there are clearly some people right now who are struggling. Mm. Uh, 
the, the increase in interest rates and the reduction in single farm payment at the smaller end of the farming spectrum is causing cash flow difficulties. Yeah. 100%. At the other end of the spectrum, the bigger, I'm going to say more business-like, I don't mean that disrespectfully to anybody else, but people, they're doing cash flows, mm. they're managing staff, they're, they're, they're running it like a business, not like it, a lifestyle. I was just about to say yeah. it's less than a lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they spend more time in the office. They spend more time looking at figures and numbers. They know from a dairy perspective today, for example, they'll know their cost of production, but within that, they'll know how much they're spending on vet and med, how much they're spending on feed, what's their labor cost as a, as a pence per liter of milk. Mm. You know, so they can get their cost of production right now. At that end, those guys are still making money. Yeah. Uh, and they're looking to expand and they're looking to grow and just generally work within the tram lines of the sh the government, the shambles of the government policy which we have. Yeah, <laughs> Putting so. it very mildly there, yeah, Nick. Yeah. So, in I mean, we're speak speaking about big businesses there that really yeah. understand the cost, but presumably as well, there must be, you know, there will be small and medium businesses that really have drilled down into their costings. That, oh, there are. You know, the, oh, they, there are, they are yes. still making a living there. Oh, yeah, 100%. And actually, again, coming on the stand today, we've had uh, family farms, partnerships, sole traders coming onto the stand and looking to continue to grow from... You know, what would be an average base, 150, 200 cows, and looking to go to 250, 300 cows, bringing their sons or daughters into the partnership, yeah. looking to grow and expand with them. And fresh ideas. Yeah, fresh ideas, yeah. energy, enthusiasm uh, coming on. Yeah. And we're keen, and we, you know, it's not just about the big, in, it's not just about big farming, is it? It has to be a cross section of farming. That's it, there has to be something for yeah. everybody yeah. at the end of the day. And we're keen to, keen to support, you know, right the way through the, the demographic and the range of farming sizes and, uh, and statuses, really. Yeah. So in terms of, I don't know, I suppose you could say, trends of the products that you're offering, what sort of, what's, is there any sort of emerging ones that are being really popular at the moment that people are going for? So we're in an unusual time, aren't we, mm. financially? So interest rates have probably peaked. I think everyone would agree that they've probably peaked now. And that you know, our... We can't forecast, but internally, our metrics that we're using for base rate, for example, is that sometime by the end of the year, between four and 4.25 is what we're using internally as a forecast for base right. rate. Now, we're likely to be wrong, but it's, that shows you the direction from 5.25 heading generally down. What that means is that most farmers today are still taking variable rate products on their long-term loans. Mm. So we're not doing fixed rate uh, term loans at all, long term loans at all at the moment. That might come back. Yeah, when it settles, it settles down a little bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the other trends that we're seeing, clearly there's a massive focus by all farmers on, by most farmers, on climate and regenerative agriculture and starting to think about biodiversity, about carbon, about water. Mm. You know, we're having more and more conversations with people like you know, the environmental farmers group, just as an example, as to how they're working with the water companies and the biodiversity entities to actually get additional revenue streams into their businesses. Yeah, and those sort of environmental pressures, presumably they're just going to increase and increase. You know, we're not, we're only, I suppose we're only on the... Uh, so when we speak to farmers, we try and encourage them not to think of these sustainability, regenerative, as some kind of onerous activity. Mm. We think think of it as a additional revenue stream that you should be thinking about in the same way as you think about milking the cows or growing a crop of potatoes or wheat or whatever. Yeah. Think about it in that way. How can I maximize the opportunity out of that sustainable, regenerative, all the other buzzwords around at the moment? There is a pot of income there which you can go for, and within the next five to ten years, there'll be income lines on your balance, on your PL, which will say, you know, milk, calves, carbon, water, biodiversity. Yeah. I would, uh, you know, I'm not a gambling man, but if I was, I'd put money on that. Within ten years, yeah. that will be a significant revenue stream in the, in the, in the books of farmers. Good stuff. Well, Nick, thank you very much for that, that little insight. I'm You're sure we could sit here and chat all day about yeah, finance because yeah. it's such a massive topic. But, uh, yeah, for now, thank well, you. Normally, very... normally, by the way, bankers are the, are the last person you want to speak to, but uh, hopefully, uh, I know, hopefully but it'll be quite interesting. Like though. you said, it's by farmers for farmers. Yeah. You've got a big USP there. There's a yeah, big yeah. difference. Yeah. And, you know, I've only met you guys for the first time today. I can tell there's a difference already. Yeah, yeah, no. You know, that big corporate mentality is not there. No, no. So, 
if it ever gets there, come and give me a I'll let you know. Shot, you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't no worries, and next yeah. time we'll have a pint as well. Fantastic. Nice Thank you very much. Cheers, welcome. Gents, our coverage of the 2024 Dairy Tech event continues, and I'm now on the Omnia Digital stand with Harry Rebet, who's going to talk us through this device, which I believe is the TerraMap. So, Harry, explain to me James. what is it? What's it do? So, James, this um, I'm sure you're familiar with the term gamma ray spectrometry. Every now and again, this yeah. Is a gamma Crops ray up. Spe spectrometer. Yeah. So, essentially, what this is, this is our digital soil mapping service. Um, and this is mapping naturally occurring passive background radiation from the soil. Right. So we're mapping four isotopes, cesium, uranium, potassium, thorium. And then from that, we can then be guided by the, by the computers on the machines to where we're going to go and take our soil samples from. Okay. So we'll, we'll then take a number of soil samples off the back of this data. Right. So we're taking 800 readings every hectare from this, this piece of machine, right. machinery. Um, so it, that allows us to build a really clear, accurate, and detailed picture of the phosphate, potash, pH, magnesium levels across the field. Right. In, as far as organic matter, carbon, whatever the, a farmer wants. And to you're saying to. this is a guide to how you take your samples, is it? It doesn't just do it all for you? No, so it, this isn't telling us how much phosphate no. or how much potash we've got in the soil. Um, this maps all those isotopes, yeah. and then on the back of that map, it'll say you need to take a soil sample here, 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 and here. Right. And then we use those soil sample results to calibrate the map. So right. we couple the two bits of information together, yeah. the soil analysis, the gamma ray map, and layer those two together, and then we can calibrate between our soil sample locations okay. to produce a really high right. detailed, high so definition when it's map. Trying to tell you the ideal location to go and do your soil sampling. What's it kind of? What's it sort of looking for? What are the determining factors to say? Right, take your sample here. So it's looking at the total count of isotopes across right. the field. So we will get a map from red to red to blue. High levels of total count of isotopes. Low levels of so total count. And we'll, the, the the computer will say, well, let's take a calibration sample up here and there's high levels of isotope oh, and, and, a, and one down here in the low levels and then it will, it will uh, spread in, in between to get a good a good spread across that field yeah. essentially where we're going to take those soil samples from. And then ultimately you're getting a, a really good understanding of actually what's under your feet effectively. Yeah. Cool yeah. stuff. And then this this device that we see here <laughs> in miniature I this presume. This is a, a scaled down yeah, yeah. We don't employ three year olds to no. buy them. No. <laughs> So yeah. what sort of scale will we be talking with this uh, device then? Uh, not a lot bigger. The sort of full-size scanner is probably a, nearly a metre wide, probably. And we have them on a range of ATV-type vehicles, yeah. small four-wheel drives, um, yeah, anything really. And when you're going up and down doing your scans of the field, do yeah. you do it at certain spacings, you know, when you're going up and down? What sort yeah. is, what's so, your ideal sort of spacing? Um, we'll drive every sort of 10 to 12 metres. Yeah. Um, if there's tram lines in a field, uh, it might suit every tram line or every tram line and one in the middle um, or sort of roughly between 10 and 12 meters. Right. Anyway, yeah. Okay. So. And the, uh, the map that you are ultimately creating with all the soil samples and what this is doing as well. Yeah. Can you overlay that with other maps such as yield maps and things yeah. like that of that field? Yeah. So Omnia, um, you can see behind us, is, is, is the sort of farm management piece of software mm. that hosts all this data. So in there, we've got yield maps, we've got biomass imagery from satellites, any sort of farm data management layer you, yeah. you, can, you can think of. And yeah, you can overlay the two. And then also with this data, we can produce variable rate fertilizer and nutrition plans on the back of it. So right. we take our pH map, for instance. It's a really good example as, a, as an easy win. And then tailor our lime requirements on the back of our pH map. Right. So we might be applying five tonne a hectare in one corner of the field and possibly even nothing in the other corner of the field. Yeah. But really easy wins in terms of financially and doing the right things for the crop and the soil. Exactly. So on top of effectively the soil nutrition, 
Yeah. What else can we sort of do with this? What else can we map? Um, quite often now, people are looking to map organic matter, particularly with the new SFI schemes that are coming. Organic matter mm. is, is in, increasingly on people's radar, so we can do an organic matter map in exactly the same way, or carbon maps as well, so organic carbon and even active carbon layers. Um, and then the other thing also maps is soil texture, so your sand, okay. silt, clay fractions. Yeah. Um, and if a farmer is looking to go down that variable rate drilling route, mm. that's the layers of data that you want to sort of start producing those seed rate plans from. Right. Again, all managed through the Omnia platform. Yeah, so you can really build up those layers and build up yeah, one you can, heck of a picture. An, really. an enormous number of layers of yeah. data we can gather in one pass. Yeah. And that's the beauty of this. This and like I say, you've got it all managed through your yeah. platforms and portals. Yeah, and, and Omnia, well, that does all that precision bit very well because that's where it was bred from. Mm. It also can act as a farm management piece of software for um, farms who aren't necessarily wanting to get into this level of detail, who are looking more at a whole field approach. Yeah. So nutrition management, manure management, um, SFI management, MVZ compliance, does all that as well. So I've got a lot of dairy farmers, I mentioned dairy farmers because we're at a dairy Absolutely, show. Absolutely, yeah. Um, who use Omnia for that and don't necessarily go for this just yet, but going forward. This could be the next level. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Well, Harry, thank you very much for that. Thanks, uh, James. Absolutely great, huh? Cheers. Gents, you now join us on the GFC Agri stand, uh, and with Megan Joseph. Who, well, we're going to have a chat about one of your so. Uh, well, there's a bit of a buzz about it, which is the uh, Evolution Automatic Car Feeder. So, Megan, take it away. Tell me about this. Yeah, so perfect. So. Um the machine's been in the UK for a few years now. There's two different models. You've got the S2 and the S4. The main kind of headlines of the product really are it's user-friendly. You've got a seven-inch display screen there. It's a um, touch screen, that, is it? It is, yeah. Oh, so right, literally there we go. just use and go. You've got... Will it work with gloves on and things like that? And it mucky will, gloves? Yeah, and you're all good Is this that. quite robust as well? Because you know what's going to happen with this, don't you? Waterproof, flat yeah. out, use it as you want. But kept it basic, so calf number there. Obviously, you've got the feed curve there on, and then you've got the last 24 hours of feed. So it's just really, really quick to identify if the calf has or hasn't fed and sort of instigates you to go and check on them a little bit quicker than you might have noticed. Right, got you. So, so you say you do two versions of this. What is that? It's the S... S2 and an S4. S2 so and S4. So is that different capacities or what's the main difference? It is, yeah. So the S2 has two feed stalls with it and the right. S4 has up to four stalls. So this will be the S2, is it, presumably, this one? or is it? Um, this is the S4. Oh, this is the S4, right. It is. So you've got two hoppers in there and then you've also got two mixing bowls. Right. And then those two will separately feed two stalls each. So you can simultaneously feed four calves at a time. Right. So in terms of, I suppose you could say, the, the positioning of it and mechanics of it, how would it sort of work within a calf pen? Would you put it in between two calf pens or, or would you it, put it in one? Or It varies massively, to be honest. It's a lot... Um, the early stages of shed design are very important because obviously you want to get your drainage and everything else in the right place. But for some people, they'll have them sort of in the middle of the shed out the way and then piped into the pen separately. Right. It's just, yeah, varies a lot depending on design, number of calves, everything like that. But lots to consider in the initial stages. So this is quite a flexible unit then? Very flexible, yeah, yeah very flexible. Right. So suitable for 35 calves, suitable for 140 calves. Right, okay. And what's a stages well in terms of the calf's age would they sort of be introduced to this sort of you device could, you might say you could be looking at days old you could be right looking at days old so days old weeks old and then obviously you wean them off yeah as once they're drinking themselves yeah. they're away then basically yeah they're away very easy and obviously because it's automatic you've got that natural feeding action they go to and from as they want so it's very like as as they would with them right and can you do you know your powder mixing in this or do you do that beforehand and then put it in this so how's it how's it work it does it literally all for you so all the right only, the only thing you need to do is put the powder into the machine so you put the powder into the hopper and Plum the mixer does everything else yeah. in there heats it does That's everything it. 
literally that's it. Just so leave it to it. And does it go through certain cleaning cycles as well? It does, To yeah. look so after itself. What you can do is after each calf feeds, the, it can do an antibacterial teat wash as well. So between feeds, then it will do a full clean out. Spot on. Well, Megan, thank you very much for Thanks that. Thanks for having me. That's been great. <laughs> Cheers. Perfect.